Hello everyone, welcome to automated end-to-end -end testing with Nightwatch. Thanks for coming for the last session of the conference. It's really great to turn up. Uh, if you're in the wrong session, yeah, we're going to be talking about testing. So how many people do like testing? That's not a lot. There are a few explanations to that. So we're going to go through and uh, going to see what we can do about it. Maybe after that we're going to have a few more hands up. I won't. So just first things first, uh, Friday contribution sprints tomorrow. Please come if you never contributed. It's a lot of fun sometimes, sometimes not, but it's a very good process to learn and help others to contribute. Please uh, evaluate the sessions. And that doesn't mean only this one, that all you've seen, even online. That helps a lot to build the sessions for the next DrupalCon, so please do that. All right, so uh, my name is Vladimir. I am team lead and uh, backend developer most of my time. Do many other things. Uh, this is a link to a night which uh, where I put all the slides and resources, and you can tweet about, uh, use this handle to tweet about me. Came all the way to Australia to present, and pretty much right there on the bottom, that's where I spent uh, most of the time doing Nightwatch in the last year. So let's talk about test, and, and let's, I'll just gonna talk that this session, I put it as a beginner session, because I wanna basically give you a basis, why do we need to test? why the testing is not something that you can kind of exclude, put it in a box and forget about it, and uh, why everyone should care about it. So let's look at software development lifecycle. Everyone likes diagrams. So we have requirements coming from the client, coming internally, you want to build your startup. Uh, you have uh, implementation, let's say it's Drupal, for no particular reason. And uh, we actually produce the uh, test based on requirements. So we have a set of tests, and we test our implementation against the tests. If the tests pass, it means the requirements are... Uh, basically, we build the implementation according to the requirements. So let's create a simple requirement, right? We want to search for a surname, uh, and we want to display a person's information, right? So. Uh, to write manual tests is quite easy, so we go to a search engine, no particular one, uh, we type uh, surname into a search box, and we check for the results in the right hand side area, just because it's no particular uh, search engine. Type particular last name, and we see on the right hand side, uh, you can uh, see the details. You can do that with movies as well, and music. So let's write an automated test. What are we actually going to test? It's a bit different from what we did in the requirements. So first of all, making sure that the actual page is visible. Uh, then we make sure that the search button is visible. So these are our two assertions. Next, we enter our surname, we click the button. The, our third assertion is uh, that our right hand side area is visible after we click the button. And it actually contains what we want. So that's our test uh, as a night watch. We're going to go through it later on. But let's run it. So basically, type type it. And you can see our four assertions which you just wrote. They all pass. So we're all happy campers. Right. So what is night watch and why are we actually using it? So night watch is a command line test runner. So you run it from your command line, and it runs tests. Tests are written in JavaScript. How many people did anything in JavaScript ever? That's a bit more, so it's quite good. I think we're going to do all right. It uses CSS selectors, so if you work with a jQuery, uh, it's pretty easy to understand that type of stuff. If not, it's, uh, it's not a rocket science. It actually also uses XPath for the lovers of very complicated things. It has continuous integration support, so whatever your uh, continuous integration process is. So on the le left-hand side, you can see there is a um, code 
our code repositories. In the middle, there is uh, all sorts of different automated building tools. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see some reincarnation of containers, virtual machines, whatever you do there. And uh, you can pretty much implement Nightwatch anywhere there. And it also has uh, cloud services support. So uh, people using browser stack to check how it looks on their browser. People using Sauce Labs. If not, we're going to have a look at the one of the example uh, with the Sauce Labs in the end. So, and it's easy to extend because it's written in JavaScript and Node.js. So you can actually extend and um, create custom commands. So for example, for, uh, um, for Drupal, there can be a specific commands you can test. Uh, for example, make sure that on every page there's no error message, something like that. That also corresponds to assertion and reporters. In terms of reporters, gives you reports in a particular format. If, if you want to actually want to see them in a different format, you just write a custom reporter. So for example, it produces you XML. If you want to see it in JSON, you just write whatever. So let's talk about reports. Who needs testing and who likes reports? So we have our developer. Our developer created a particular functionality. On top of that, he created another particular functionality and broke the first one. But on his machine, it's running. So we have our project manager coming in saying, uh, is uh, functionality two ready? What our developer says? He's already thinking about something else. <laughs> we have our business analyst comments asking, Great, do the production, because that's how we're all. And of course, he runs to the client and says, it's all done. The client says, great, and then says this. Your software testing is bad and you should feel bad. But let's see it from a different perspective. Let's say we have a coverage of uh, Nightwatch for those particular two functions. Once the function two pushed, Nightwatch runs test against function one, function two, produces reports, and reports it to, let's say, everyone in the company, just for no particular reason. It might be just developer, but let's say uh, it works for everyone. Of course, client might ask, is my functionality ready? And BA would ask, yes, but uh, F1 is broken. So what client would tell after that? I guess we all want client say that, right? So uh, to summarize the report, reporting, why developers like reporting? So of course, it's a technical detail to report on the features and the functionality that they put in. And uh, also uh, making sure that the integration with uh, any other systems actually uh, put together properly. Uh, developers can use it Nightwatch in a sprint retrospective. And I had practice of that, whereas instead of actually going through the features of the last sprint they implemented, they um, just sat down, click play, and the automated testing tool would just play for them, where, uh, so the boss can see. So internal team, managers, PMs, BAs, uh, we can report them less technical details. It depends on our testing structure and uh, issue structure, but uh, uh, still, uh, for example, we don't have to send them technical details. We just send them. Here's number of tests, we failed five, we um, succeeded 100, there you go. So they already know what to say to the client and they already know what to go to next morning meeting. Uh, you can measure velocity on that. So how your team is delivering or are they delivering uh, the actual functionality they promised. That's a very good tool to have. Uh, and uh, you can also integrate it with your internal tools, so Slack. Have a notification. I have a notification every morning coming in, test run at 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. the test run. Have a notification to Slack, come to work, or look on my phone. So good, or not so good. So uh, someone must be responsible. Uh, clients, clients doesn't ha even have to have the as detailed report as internal team, but it's always good to have. Here's your piece of the software, and here's a warranty to it. We tested all those features, and they do work. And trust me, when you start the project and you produce the report on the first day, 
That's very, very impressive. On the other hand, client can see if uh, something is not being properly defined. Uh, they can actually go and uh, uh, do a review and say, yeah, we actually need to redefine particular items and redo them later on. So uh, re our report output can be visual, so we can actually see what's going on. Uh, com it can be in the command line, so we saw that thing happening with ticks and stuff. And uh, Nightwatch also produces the report in JUnit XML. And as I said before, you can produce any sort of report. At one project, we actually produced a JSON, which was wrapped in an Angular small app. And uh, anyone can go and say, show me only failed tests, sh show me details of the failed test, or show me all tests, and it just yeah, basically quickly adjust to what you're asking. Oh, let's have a look at the demo. Can everyone see that actually? Or should I? So just to show you what I'm actually running. So first I'm gonna run test name. So it's a basically a simple Nightwatch command running in Safari and uh, just running a single script which basically tests what we saw before. So you can see uh, the browser opening on the back, runs through checks. I put a bit of pause so it won't close straight away. Uh, you can see the second visual result is actually in our uh, CLI. So four, four assertions passed that we set. And for developers who really like to read the XML, we go to a reports folder. And uh, we can see a particular test running on uh, different machines. So we actually run Safari, the Chrome was from previous one. So uh, yeah, so it says errors here and so on and so forth. Any questions so far? Uh, we shall continue. So let's talk about the actual tests, how we can run them. So Nightwatch test written in JavaScript. Most of you can write a JavaScript, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, each test can have multiple assertions. As we saw before, we said we need to check for assertions for a particular functionality. Done. Yep. So here's our simple test that we wrote. So the title of the test can be anything. Don't treat it as a user story. I just put it there as an example. That's what I use. You can put test in Google. Uh, so. It's a standard uh, Node.js functionality. You define the export function so you can run later on. The, all the magic happens actually inside the function. You pass uh, the browser object, and the browser object says, go to this URL and wait for this element is visible. And time out for one second. Set value in this particular input field. Uh, this particular value, uh, wait for element to be visible, and then click on this button. So this is our third assertion. We're waiting for element right-hand right side block is visible. And then we just make sure that the text that we put in is uh, there. And then we end our test. You can have a multiple uh, functions. So you can define multiple um, user stories, for example. And we're going to have a look at the example of that. So uh, each file can contain multiple tests. So as an example, I will go to home page, and here we see the uh, first test. Here is the second test. If you notice, there is no end on the end of the first test. So it just keeps going. If it fails, I think it skips most of them. Uh, the following one, but it will go on the next file. And uh, each folder can have multiple uh, files, and there can be multiple folders inside it. The folders are more like uh, groups. So we can group tests together, for example, uh, 
authenticated user functionality and non-authenticated user functionality. <laughs> so we can group uh, functionality accordingly. So if you look back at our example, so we can see uh, inside our tests we have folder DrupalCon and inside there we have uh, folder Dublin. So if we go and look at our examples, how we can group stuff. So if we uh, look at our npm run, uh, there is um, ah, actually removed it. So good. So as you see, the standard example is night watch. Then you specify the environment and then you specify the tests. So what if we just want to run all uh, skip the uh, name and run all the Drupal con stuff? It's pretty easy. Like we just copy that. actually have executable and then instead of the actual file we put dot dash g and dash drupal com and you can see it goes drupal com homepage and it tries to run a particular test and it would fail it so you can see here is a, a fail report so again uh, first test three assertions run passed the second one, the second assertion failed. So it just went and uh, it would jump on another file if there would be one. So I created the folder Dublin inside it, which is empty one. So if we'll uh, go and say Drupal colon slash uh, Dublin, yeah, it would say there's not, nothing there. Uh, as you can see, there is a Selenium running on the back. And we're gonna talk about uh, environments quite soon. So, and the, there is ability to tag the tests. So, as you saw before, I, um, I name my test as a user stories. So, if, for example, uh, manager wants to see which user stories passed for a particular sprint, I can actually tag all the issues for a particular sprint as sprint uh, four, let's say. So, here, name was a Sprint four or project, particular project, or even user, so you can put as many things as you want. And uh, so let's say sprint four as a tag, and we go to our common line. And instead of group, we'll put dash dash tag sprint four. So theoretically, it should run all of them. But it would only run name because name has a tag sprint four and it would skip Drupal con fingers crossed. Yes. Okay, there you go. Live demos that always. Okay. So and uh, yeah, that's what I just went through. So there is example, so you can actually have multiple as many tags as you want. It just make sure you work with the people and make sure the tags are sensible. And if you give developers to do the testing, make sure they put whatever you want them to put in. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of tags that no one uses. In, in fact, I, I would encourage you not to use tags in the first place and then see what you actually, after you probably grow out of 100 tests, then you probably would start using them. Any questions about the actual writing tests and running tests? So let's talk about environment. So the first is my box. Uh, at the moment, what you've seen, it's run here. Uh, I can run it on any box, Windows, Linux, Mac. And here's a stack for it. So we have our scripts. The scripts run in Nightwatch. And uh, Nightwatch is based on Node.js, so you need to have Node.js installed in your box. So you have a Selenium. Selenium server, it's a set of tools. Uh, to actually help you automate browser tests and they're quite popular and they're downloaded for free but they're based on Java so you need to install Java on your machine. And then we have a Selenium web driver. Selenium web driver it's a set of executables that actually allows you to uh, emulate in the real time uh, the browser. So you can have um, any particular browser running there. So it's not really a browser but it's, a, it's a basically it's like a language to talk to your browser. So you, you, for Selenium, you can even uh, do a Phantom JS. So if you, if you, if you did stuff before just with Phantom JS, is actually you can include it as a part of uh, of the Selenium suite. 
and uh, Selenium talks to the drivers, uh, and driver talks to a brow to the browser. So if you'll uh, so if I run my script. can see the selenium would actually uh, respond. respond there you go and once you install selenium it's just one jar file there are instructions on the selenium website and all you need to do is just around selenium server dash p and then port the standard port for selenium it's double four double four here we go so this is a local stack so you can run you can run it from your local box so as i said selenium is a set of tools downloadable as a one jar file it supports many operating systems, so it uh, runs on Java. And uh, if you actually try to write tests directly into the driver, not through Nightwatch, it's pretty complicated. It's a big time waste. Uh, and uh, for this particular environment, in the Nightwatch.json file, you just put the configuration of your local host and the particular port. So as I showed before, here's how you run the Selenium server. So Selenium WebDriver, it allows Selenium to run native browser agents. Um, Firefox used to be by default because Firefox didn't require any um, configuration changes until last month. They decided to go with a new driver called Gecko. They didn't include it in the master yet. So if you'll run example on a Nightwatch test and your Firefox, Firefox would open blank, that's the reason. Uh, in the next couple of versions, they're going to put it inside, and you need to provide a couple of more parameters in the configuration, or there are instructions on Stack Overflow how to actually enable it at the moment. So they basically took over and said, we want to run uh, in a marionette format. I'm not going to go deeper than that, but if you'll see the blank Firefox when you start running a Nightwatch test, that's the reason why. Uh, Safari requires, and I didn't say what it requires, it actually requires the um, extension. Uh, it's downloaded from Selenium website. They stopped doing it at version 2.48, they're now 2.53, but now um, it still works. So Chrome, again, you need to download the web driver for that, IE or Edge browsers. Uh, you can actually test them on a Linux machine and Phantom JS web driver. So here's how you install the uh, Safari one, and it's the easiest <coughs> way at the moment to actually run the Nightwatch straight out of the box. So you download this extension from a Selenium website and you put it in your Safari browser. And you basically define uh, the path to your um, web drivers like that in uh, CLI ar arguments of the Nightwatch.json. All right, so um, a lot of people would ask if I wanna put it as a part of my continuous integration, I usually would run it on a server. So no, uh, Desktop, what should I do then? You, you still can test it. Uh, there is a tool called uh, XVFB, and all it does, it basically creates a virtual screen, and you can still install, for example, in your Linux, you install Firefox, or you install Chrome, and uh, then you run it through I I XVFB. It's basically, it basically runs like a service, and it's a virtual screen. You can define multiple virtual screens for different purposes. So again, uh, just uh, runs natively. Again, any browser just outputs the uh, HTML and test, test it, um, test, test the HTML. And my favorite one is the using cloud services. So if you don't like doing all of that, and install Selenium and Java and Driver and try to configure it, uh, there, there is a way to do it. You go in the cloud. And uh, using Source Labs, it's uh, today's example. So Source Labs is basically a service that gives you a Selenium and a bunch of other stuff so that you can uh, leverage in your environment, and it gives you an output back. 
on top of that, it also gives you the ability to test in uh, multiple operating systems, including uh, mobile phones. So the changes to our configuration file is we basically say instead of a local host, now it's on demand source labs with <coughs> port 80 for uh, test settings and Selenium settings. And then we just define the variables for our username. So when you register with source labs, they give you username and they give you a password. This is a paid service, the source labs. So they give you the two weeks free. So let's have a look at how we run uh, the actual source labs. So the actual, uh, actual website is here. So once you log in, you have a dashboard. You have a, um, a list of the tests that's ran before. I was trying to integrate by default. You see it will give you a question mark because you have to communicate. Because Source Labs doesn't really know if your test pass or fail. All it does, it takes your test, it runs them through Selenium, and sends you back to you. So it's up to you to write a hook and actually to um, update Source Labs. As you can see, I did that before. So if it failed, it go like this, and if it uh, didn't, it give you a nice little check. So I have a different configuration here uh, with a source labs username and access key already enabled. Uh, the, th the stuff I didn't go through is actual configuration, so you can configure different things, and uh, source labs gives you also ability to configure the operating system and the version. So here's a good example of um, Chrome desktop macOS. So you go and say, I want to run uh, Chrome on the macOS 10.11 and uh, using version of Chrome 53 and using particular resolution. Most of my tests failed because it actually started testing them on 10.24 by default. So a lot of them kind of hit the menus and did a bunch of stuff because it was a tablet. You can see other examples like IE 11 Safari Edge iOS, here's the iOS example. So because it's a different uh, nightwatch.json, it's actually nightwatch.json remote, uh, what we're gonna do, we're gonna uh, do the following command. So a nightwatch, we, we're gonna test the Chrome desktop macOS, and we use this particular configuration. We're gonna send all tests, and let's see what's gonna happen. All right, so it talks to uh, source labs at the moment, so you can see it takes a bit more time to actually communicate, but you'll see the test I'm popping up once they actually went through source labs. At the same time, if we look at the source labs, we can see uh, the test is running. You can see which operating system, which browser. You can pretty much run it overnight and uh, yeah, have all your tests covered. It's a great little service. It has a bunch of stuff. So once the test runs, so it's still um, slipping. So let's give it a couple more seconds. So one test run. For some reason, there is nothing here. Oh no, it did. Sorry, it's a mistake. So it's on top. Uh, I did exactly the same test as you can see, and now it's uh, trying to go through a name. So the good thing about Nightwatch is it allows you also to take screenshots and Source Labs also records a video for you. So you can go and see what actually happened if you're not sure why the te particular test failed. So if our test failed and uh, yeah, you can see here, but as I said before, uh, Source Labs doesn't know anything about it. So if we'll go to our homepage test here. So as I said, you got a video, you can run the video see what actually happened. So it actually checks for registering the L button. If you didn't see the test. And that's it. It actually couldn't find it, that's why it fails. Uh, and then it uh, takes default screenshots. You can uh, also set up which screenshots you want. Some people using software which compares screenshots to a uh, previous version of screenshots, making sure that CSS isn't broken. So you can leverage that as well, but it's not part of this service. This allows you just to take a screenshots. You can see the logs. 
and you can see the metadata. Any questions about source apps? No? Do you want to grab the mic? Just quickly. So, um, I mean, does it have the capability to kind of, yeah, have teams so the clients could, like, go on and uh, see reports without being able to kind of run tests and stuff? Yep. So, um, team management. You can actually see per team, uh, you can see the reports per team who is running the particular test and so on and so forth. So yes, it does. All right, let's keep going. So one of the um, tests I have, whatever runner are you using for tests, for example, in one of the examples we use CodeShip uh, or any other CI tool you use, you can basically communicate with the source labs. They have pretty good API. Okay, so again, why Nightwatch? Quickly, it's a common light test runner. Yesterday at one of the uh, JavaScript testing, someone asked why do we need another test runner? Thank the mod mirror. It's actually, we have a choice. Uh, it uses JavaScript, so pretty easy to write the script as you saw can get quite complex, but um, in, the, in the end, you just check in basically for particular values and try to um, interact with uh, particular functionality. So it uses CSS selectors and XPath. Uh, it has continuous integration support and it has cloud services support. Advantages, you can test any website. It doesn't have to be Drupal. So from that perspective, it's pretty good. You actually, yeah can run any project, Node.js becomes popular, your company does both, fine. Django, sure. Uh, Complements unit testing. So if you're using uh, any particular unit testing, it's very good. It's E2E, it's something you can show to your boss, it's something you can show to your client um, in the reports that we actually have seen. It has visual artifacts, screenshots, and if you're using source labs, videos. Always handy, especially uh, like if you really rely on making sure that the brand stays visually the same. And continuous integration and uh, services support. So disadvantages, takes time to, uh, for initial setup, especially when the Firefox failed. There was no node, so people start figuring out what's actually going on. And it's because they just remove particular functionality from Firefox. And uh, Selenium can give you grief, and I can go on and on and on and on. But at the same time, again, it's like any other tool. Uh, basic coding knowledge required. So, but as it uses JavaScript, that's probably the most one of the most popular languages there. So here are some resources. So Nightwatch, GitHub, and the website. Website has a quite a sophisticated API. A Selenium website and Source Labs website. Check them out. If you want to know more. Check out uh, Matthew's yesterday session on JavaScript unit testing. He actually goes, the, the in Acquia they're using uh, Nightmare, which I found out about yesterday. So probably should have had like a death match or something. So they use uh, Nightmare, but he talks more about unit testing and actual, he goes deeper into testing for front end. So, but he also covers uh, Nightmare, which is alternative to Nightwatch. So you can check them out and see which one actually works better for you. Again, Friday contribution sprints. If you're here, please come and please review the sessions. So I, I can take quite a few questions. So if you want me to demo something, I can do that. Anyone? Yep. Yep. So a uh, good example was I'm running a, a conference in Australia and um, put the Drupal 8 website together. And uh, Bootstrap, Bootstrap theme, was updated from beta to RC. They changed something to their menu structure. So visually, it looked fine. So when I updated uh, Bootstrap to RC, compiled SAS, yeah. I compiled SAS, all looked fine, until actually a week later, I started clicking on the menus, and the background of the menus went um, gray instead of blue. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just put it as a test. So next time I'm going to upgrade, uh, I'm going to upgrade Bootstrap. It's going to find out if um, uh, 
if it actually there was a change. You can actually see uh, on the Nightwatch website uh, there is uh, other ways you can test stuff and one of them is uh, behavior driven development the mocha style. So BDD assertion so you can say for example I want to make sure that the element body is present before one second. Uh, the element have particular CSS. Uh, the element has an attribute that has a particular value, the el element is an actual uh, particular type, or element is visible, so stuff like that. So yeah, you can test the CSS values, and uh, it's actually quite handy. Some people think it's an overkill, but in my case scenario, I don't really wanna go, and after each bootstrap update, check my menu uh, background right. color. Okay. Anyone else? Yep, uh, there is a driver for i8. I'm not sure what's, what sort of support, if they dropped it or not. Uh, Selenium wrote most of the drivers, except the Gecko one for Firefox. Uh, I think it's uh, some of the companies just pick up their own support for the drivers, so you better check for a particular one. But yeah, there was uh, i8. I think it, it started with i8. I'm not sure if there's a i7. Okay. Cool. That's a good tip. Actually, I'm uh, not sure if I can check if Source Labs actually have a list of browsers. There is a way uh, to put together the test actually saying, uh, uh, saying which particular operating system you can source run on. Yes, no. Yeah, uh, need to check the docs, I guess. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time, but I will check for next time if it actually, if uh, Source Labs has IE8 support. Anyone else? Not necessarily, no, you can run Phantom with, uh, yeah. Uh, it just, you just have an option. It's usually for continuous integration. So for example, if you want to run, Phantom as well as other browsers. I haven't seen that's like the case in a live situation. Some developers do because they want to compare how Phantom natively, uh, I guess, compares to Phantom and Selenium. But I just, I guess, <laughs> if you really want to do that, uh, yeah. Usually use Phantom when you can't access the browser, but if you have access to browsers, why would you do that? So. There is, a, there is an option to run that, so why not? Oh, done? Well, thank you very much for coming again. You can please review the session. You can uh, tweet this session as well. And I put the slides up to uh, uh, drupal.org and please test. Thank you very much.